It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Maram Bixen, who is the Shames Professor of Biomedical Engineering at the City College of New York, of the City University of New York, and co-director of the Neural Engineering Group at the New York Center for Biomedical Engineering. Dr. Bixen received his BS in Biomedical Engineering from Johns Hopkins University and his PhD in Biomedical Engineering at Case Western Reserve. So his laboratory uh, uh, is focused on R&D activity that spans preclinical studies, computational models, device design and fabrication, regulatory activities, and clinical trials. Technologies developed by his group are in clinical trials in over 200 medical centers and include neuromodulation interventions for neuropsychiatric disorders, intra- and post-operative sensors, patient compliance tools, and surgeon training stimulators. Dr. Bixen has published over 200 papers and book chapters and is the inventor of over 30 patent applications. Dr. Bixen co-invented high-definition transcranial direct current stimulation, the first non-invasive targeted and low-intensity neuromodulation technology. Today, Dr. Bixen is going to tell us about the potential and limitations of transcranial direct current stimulation. Please help me welcome Dr. Bixen. Good morning, uh, and uh, yes, this morning I'm going to be talking to you about transcranial direct current stimulation, um, um, or TDCS. Um, uh, these are my disclosures, and I'll, and I'll put these slides and also uh, the references I'll be citing um, through my Twitter account, at Marone Bixen. So this is uh, TDCS. Um, there are always um, two electrodes or sponges placed on the head, the positive one. Uh, it's called the anode. The negative one is, is, is called the, the cathode. And uh, these are connected via wire to a stimulator. That's certainly not a 9-volt battery, but it can be powered by a 9-volt battery. And like a 9-volt battery, it provides a, a low-level um, direct current that passes to these electrodes through the scalp and into the brain. And a uh, typical TDCS session would last about tens of minutes. Uh, most people just experience a mild uh, tingling during the stimulation itself, um, and depending on the application, um, this be could be repeated weekly, even over the course of, of weeks. And in the context of, of the TDCS literature, the terms nodal TDCS or cathodal TDCS, because you always have an anode and a cathode, actually refers to whether the target or sort of the nominal target, the intended target, is near the anode, so you have a nodal TDCS, or near the cathode, so we'll call that cathodal TDCS. And this ends up being very important uh, uh, to our under based on our understanding of how TDCS works, where the anode and the cathode are not equivalent. The anode, the positive terminal, is where current is pushed into the brain, so it crosses into the cortex, and the cathode, the negative electrode, current exits the brain, so it passes out of the cortex. And so the, the neurons that are in the cortex under the anode versus the cathode are exposed to a different direction of current flow. And this is uh, presumed to produce an a, a asymmetric form of polarization at the anode rather than, as opposed to the cathode, where under the anode, pyramidal neurons in the cortex would have their soma depolarized. Uh, and this is presumed to lead generally to an increase in excitability. Well, at the cathode, pyramidal neurons near the cathode, pyramidal neurons will have their somas hyperpolarized, which is presumed to lead to, to, to a decrease in excitability. Um, now, uh, many of you may have already heard about TDCS. Um, it's the most investigated uh, therapeutic technology across neuropsychiatry. Um, there, are over, there are hundreds of ongoing clinical trials, uh, 300 of them registered through clinical trials. Um, the publication rate is certainly higher than, than I can even keep up with as far as reading, and it is a very broad swath of indications, a, a sort of, a, a you name it, different mood disorders, uh, different pain disorders, um, different types of addiction from, from gambling to drug abuse. Um, now, those of you who have actually checked the first part of the statement, it's actually wrong. So let me qualify it a little bit. TDCS is the most investigated, I think, therapy across neurotechnology where uh, there remain uh, major questions uh, about its efficacy and in some cases um, 
uh, groups or individuals who challenge whether it does anything at all. And I think that that is a true statement. And so I, I want to talk about the status of TDCS and this dichotomy. Um, um, there are certainly uh, individuals and groups uh, who are strong advocates for TDCS and in the extreme uh, really see it as something like a panacea that can profoundly um, rehabilitate the brain, something that's, sort of true, uh, uh, something that's truly can heal the brain across a range of disorders. And you have a, a, another uh, extreme um, that thinks, you know, the thousands, the thousands of TDCS human trials that have been published, somehow there's something wrong with all of them, uh, and we're basically dealing with, with snake oil. And obviously, the, these, are, these, are, these are minorities at the extreme, and I would say, obviously, the, the, the truth is always somewhere in the middle, right? So I would say the status of TDCS right now, it's complicated, and that's actually what, I, what I'd, I'd want to um, talk about today. I think there are mistakes that people uh, commonly make at both of these extremes. Uh, one of them is that they assume that because TDCS is a simple intervention, right, the sort of nine volt battery connected to, to the two sponges, uh, it must have therefore a simple mechanism of action. And also if you're doing TDCS, you don't really need any sophistication as far as your trial design, you don't need any training you know, just buy a machine and, and go for it. And, and that's, that's not correct at all. Um, on the other hand, it's also the case that um, the effects of TDCS are, are complicated and, and they're nuanced and, and, and there can be mixed outcomes. Um, and again, I don't, that's not a, a deficit about TDCS. It's simply a, 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 a direct consequence of the fact that the thing we're stimulating, the brain, is a very complicated organ. And so we need to be comfortable uh, with the fact that the story may not be so simple after all. There are many forms of uh, TDCS, different ways to do TDCS. Conventional TDCS, as I showed you before, uses two large electrodes. In this case, this is the M1 SO montage. One electrode is over the motor. The other is in the supraorbital region. Um, we also have high definition TDCS. This is where instead of larger sponges, small electrodes are used, more cup-like electrodes filled with gels, and these can be put into arrays. For example, this is the, um, a high definition Forks one montage over the motor cortex. And uh, we have available to us um, these high resolution MRI derived computational models uh, that have been experimentally verified that allow us to predict the current flow pattern in the brain produced during these different stimulation modalities. And this is sort of what, what, what it looks like. Um, conventional TDCS uh, using uh, larger pads tends to produce a more diffuse current flow through the brain. It's not stimulating a, a single gyri or a particular uh, target. Um, depending on where you put the pads, you can guide the current to different regions, um, but it is very challenging to, to focalize it with conventional TDCS. Uh, with high definition, it is possible to focalize the current at least to cortical regions, and so you can, you can identify a cortical region um, and target it. And so with, with conventional TDCS, I think it's very useful to think of, of circuit therapeutics, uh, really thinking about the fact that you're actually stimulating multiple nodes in the brain, and in aggregate, the outcomes you see reflect stimulating those, those, those different brain regions. Um, but it is important to note that you can be focal uh, with non-invasive electrical stimulation, including with TDCS. And as I mentioned before, there are many forms of TDCS depending on the um, region of interest, and there have been talks at this meeting as well about it. You can apply uh, the, mont the electrodes in different positions to guide the current to different brain regions of interest, either with TDCS or with high definition TDCS. And it's, it's obvious, but it's important to emphasize that when you do that, uh, you're doing something different. TDCS is not one thing. And, and I think uh, it, it's, it's not useful to sort of conflate two different TDCS approaches uh, and consider them equivalent. It doesn't, to me, make any more sense than taking two different drugs and saying, well, they're both drugs. So we're going to just assume that these things are, this, they're both chemicals, so they must do the same thing. Um, uh, uh, another uh, important point is that we all have different shaped heads. Uh, we have different anatomy, different brain, different skulls, and as a result of that, even if you apply the same dose, the same montage to a group of individuals, the resulting brain current flow pattern will not be the same. And this gets amplified when you're talking about um, atypical anatomies or, or, or in, in, in extremes of age. Um, and so again, when you're running a trial, you're applying a single TDCS dose, uh, but not everyone is actually getting the same thing. And this is something, again, we, we, can, we can address both retrospectively or prospectively um, using these current flow models. And then a final level of nuance has to do when we look at the level of, of, of a single gyri. And it turns out that as the current flows across the brain, um, because the, the, the human brain is extremely folded, the current actually ends, actually ends up diving in and out of individual gyri. 
So at the level of a single gyri, you can have one side where the current is flowing in. You could think of this as sort of like the anodal uh, variant of TDCS, but on the very same gyri, on the other side, you'll typically have current exiting. That is the cathodal variant of TDCS, and this is happening across the whole brain. So you're really getting a zebra pattern uh, of anodal and cathodal. Um, this is something that we and others have, have investigated. Uh, there's another non-invasive stimulation technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. It's higher intensity, and when you apply that over the motor cortex, you can in produce an involuntary uh, finger twitch, which you can measure with, with a motor-evoked potential. Um, and it's been known now for over a, a decade that when you apply TDCS, um, you don't produce a motor twitch, it's too low intensity, but you can change the brain's excitability and responsiveness to TMS. So depending on how you apply TDCS, you can make the TMS more effective, producing a bigger twitch, or less effective, producing a smaller twitch. And what we did in this trial is we applied TDCS in different variants. We essentially uh, changed the direction of current flow across the motor cortex. So we were crisscrossing the motor cortex in different ways. And at the same time, we were actually rotating the, the, the TMS magnet as well to activate different pathways. And it ended up being a, a nuanced uh, and, and complex story. But what was clear was, one, we, we could produce significant changes in the brain's response to TMS. We could significantly change the brain's excitability and responsiveness. But whether we did that and how we did that depended entirely on the relative orientation of the TDCS-produced polarization and how we oriented the TMS coil, which meant which pathways we were activating. So therefore, the effects of TDCS um, are, are, are um, are certainly um, real, uh, but they're certainly nuanced. And so what are sort of like the, the, the high level integration of, of the points I've talked about so far? Um, one of which is when we think about TDCS, I think we need to think of not just the nominal target, the nominal target would be the brain region named in the title of the paper, but we need to think about the overall current flow. And, and we need to embrace the fact that we could be producing a, a net effect that may involve stimulating multiple nodes, um, especially when you're talking about atypical anatomy, but in general, uh, this can be done on an individual basis. Um, and, I, and there are tools available now um, uh, to do the kind of modeling that I've shown you before to address these kind of questions, uh, including through our lab and open source uh, software supported by NIMH called ROAST. Um, the other very important point is that the brain effects are very pathway specific. And what that means practically is you may have two labs and they're both looking at the same indication, but they're applying TDCS differently in a different montage. They're using different assessments. They're combining with different tasks. They are not doing the same thing based on what we know about TDCS. And as a result, you may actually see divergent results. And I think it would there be for be a mistake for example, in a meta-analysis, to collapse these two trials together and say, well, one set up and one set down, therefore the net effect is zero. As I mentioned before, to me, that makes as much sense as one group did one drug, another group did another drug, and somehow we're combining together and saying drug has no effect. Again, TDCS is, is, is not one thing. The other criticism that is lobbed against TDCS, this comes up sort of every few years, um, is that because the skull is resistive, when we apply TDCS to the surface of the head, um, uh, only a fraction of the current will reach the brain. Um, but again, this is not news. I've shown you uh, computational models, for example, from my group, and I've mentioned that these have been experimentally validated. We've known for a very long time that when you apply TDCS to the surface of the head, only a small fraction of, the, of that current will, will reach the brain. And what I want to dis explain to you now is, based on our understanding of TDCS, this is not some sort of secret, right? It's well known, and in fact, it's a virtue. So if you, if you sort of um, follow the story through this cartoon, um, let's imagine we have a group of neurons that we're interested to stimulate, the sort of network of interest in green. We have some other neurons that we want to spare, um, and they overlap in space, right? This could be in a single gyri. There's, there's, it's impossible to separate these two things out anatomically. And so when we apply TDCS and we produce current flow, we are applying current across both these groups of neurons. But we don't make them fire, because TDCS is low intensity. It's not TMS, it's not other forms of, of higher intensity neuromodulation. So when we apply TDCS uh, under these conditions, neither group fires, we don't activate either one. And now um, I want you to imagine that for some reason, um, the, the green population um, has become activated. Perhaps the person has been instructed to do a task Perhaps they've been instructed to, 
think something, undergoing um, some sort of therapy, and we imagine that just this one group of neurons in green has been activated, and the hypothesis is now is because they are active, this group now becomes preferentially sensitive to the effects of TDCS. And so this is a form of selectivity that we call functional targeting. It's not anatomical targeting, it's selecting out a specific function based on activity. Now this is a cartoon, I'm gonna show you um, uh, a range of, of uh, preclinical animal data that we have supporting this idea. In fact, all the animal data we have on TDCS um, um, points in this direction. So I'm going to be showing you data from, uh, uh, from rats, acute brain slices, uh, hippocampal, uh, and both cortical slices. And it's possible in these uh, animal models to use a small microelectrode to apply a shock and activate a bunch of synapses producing an excitatory postsynaptic potential, um, or if you record extracellularly a field EPSP. We saw data like that um, in the last talk. Um, and I want to mention this is not the TDCS. This is an intense microshock activating a bunch of synapses. And the size of that EPSP gives us an indication of the, st of the strength of synaptic efficacy or the strength of connection between two populations. Now we can pair this microshock with, in, 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 the, in the animal model, our version of either a nodal or cathodal TDCS, so passing the current in two different ways. And these are the, the kind of results we and, and others have seen very robustly. So in black, you have the, the baseline, now it's upside down. This is the field EPSP showing you the size of, of, of that response, the strength of that synaptic connection. And this is going to be very pathway dependent and polarity specific, but for this particular pathway, the nodal variant of, of direct current stimulation made that response bigger. So that every time we applied a microshock, we saw a bigger response suggesting that this pathway had been acutely strengthened, and we saw the opposite effect with the cathodal variant. And again, the, the, the point, point to mention is that direct current stimulation on its own is nowhere near enough to activate these synapses on its own, to trigger essentially a, a synapses in, in, in the um, afferent axons. So this is inherently functional targeting because if a synapse is inactive, it does not care about TDCS because we didn't modulate it, only the synapses that are already active for some other reason unrelated to TDCS get the benefit. And the same logic can actually be extended to long-term potentiation. So again, in the absence of TDCS, there's very well-established animal models um, of LTP, where you start with a baseline EPSP level, now you apply a blast, a blast of microshocks, and afterward you reevaluate the EPSP, and if you do it a certain way, that EPSP gets bigger and it stays bigger. So this is long-term potentiation. Some people believe it's sort of an analog of, of, of learning and, and um, memory. Now we can apply this LTP produced by the microshocks with uh, either the anodal or the cathodal form of direct current stimulation. So now we're applying them at the same time. And I need to, say, to emphasize again, the direct current stimulation on its own will not produce plasticity. So we, we, in our lab, we can do it from now until the cows come home. Weak direct current stimulation on its own does not produce plasticity. But when we combine them, uh, we see very uh, robust effects. Um, now these are again pathway uh, and polarity specific. In this particular um, uh, pathway, um, and uh, I think this data is actually from, from hippocampus. When we applied a regular uh, theta burst, that's the black trace, uh, we saw some plasticity. You can see that it, it outlasts the stimulation that's applied in that little arrow where it says TBS. When we combine this theta burst stimulation with the anodal version of direct current stimulation, we produce more plasticity. Uh, and, and to a lesser effect, for, in this case for the cathodal, we're able to suppress that plasticity. Um, now this is again inherently functional targeting, why? If you have a population of synapses that are not already undergoing plasticity, we will apply direct current stimulation and we will not influence them. This is sort of in the extreme case, right? And, but if you have a population of neurons that is already undergoing plasticity for some other reason, like the person is practicing something, right? Um, and we apply direct current stimulation at the same time, we, will, we could boost the plasticity in just those synapses. So we get this exquisite selectivity even at the synapse, never mind the cell, we're talking at the synapse specific level. Um, and, and, and an extension of this experiment that I find very interesting is it turns out you can repeat this like uh, blast of microshocks, right? This, you can do it again and again. And so in the black trace you see in the absence of direct current stimulation what happens, you, you apply a, a blast, you boost, 
um, synaptic strength. That's this field FEPSP measure. If you apply it again, you can boost it again, but eventually you get to a plateau. So you're blasting, you're blasting, but you can't get any more out of the system. So that's sort of the ceiling. Now, when you combine now this uh, a blast, this TBS, with the anodal version of direct current stimulation, you see again, you get more out of that first blast, but you also get more out of the second and a little bit more out of the third. And so where you end up after four rounds of LTP is higher than when you start in. So we can say we not just accelerate the rate of learning, we may actually, well, LTP, sorry, but it is an, right? LTP very, um, is an analog of learning. We can also boost the capacity for it. And this leads to, to um, very directly to a hypothesis about a translational hypothesis about how we should be doing TDCS in people, which is the notion that we should be applying uh, transcranial direct current stimulation in combination with a specific task or a specific other form of therapy that in itself is producing plasticity. And we're going to be using TDCS with the goal of, of boosting just that process. That's how we get selectivity. Now, to people who do TDCS, this is old news. This is actually how a majority of TDCS human trials were already been rationalized. Um, they all involve some level of anatomical targeting, so they all consider where the electrode should be placed to deliver current to a specific brain region, but typically they also include some sort of matched therapy, some sort of matched rehab, so the functional targeting component is, is, is there as well. So this is already kicked into how TDCS is done. And I, and I should also mention, for this particular individual, uh, before we started TDCS, they were scrawny. <laughs> so, uh, um, so going back to this, this, this notion of, 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 of TDCS and, and where, where we stand, um, it is complicated, but again, not in a way that I hope, I hope is, 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 is clearly not a deficit. It, actually in a way that has been characterized um, now systematically for over, over 15 years. And obviously the more layers of the onion you, you, you peel apart, you realize that, that, that the outcomes are nuanced because the brain is nuanced. I also don't think we have fully leveraged a lot of this mechanistic understanding as far as the technology we've created. And so for that reason, in my opinion, a lot of the um, both positive and negative results that we're currently seeing from trials with TDCS, these are just signals. These are signals that give us a hint uh, of what might be possible or not possible with TDCS, but in my opinion, they, they no way um, uh, would suggest the, 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 the limit uh, of what is possible with TDCS. So let me give you some, just a quick, quick, quick uh, oh, and so this is just to emphasize the point that there is a very a broad literature on TDCS, unpacking all the issues I just talked about, looking at, 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 at the effects of TDCS on multiple scales, imaging, spectroscopy, clinical neurophysiology, as well as behavior. So we have, we, have, we have a field that has unpacked a lot of complexity and a lot of nuance, and again, I think that's a virtue of, of, of TDCS. It's not a defect uh, that we're seeing that, that um, it's complicated. So one area that, that I think is, is very promising and, and, and very interesting is the combination of um, of uh, EEG with TDCS. And in principle, this is very convenient because you can use the same headgear. So the same headgear that's used for EEG, a cap with, with, with some wires in it, can at the same time also be used for, for stimulation. So it's very mechanically compatible. And the idea is that you would record EEG, perhaps in response to some kind of task, then you would apply some sort of algorithm, and you would use that to develop a prescription of stimulation. So either applying EEG across a population of individuals, and then developing sort of a, a, a therapy, an HDTDCS therapy based on that, or even on a single individual basis, recording in real time, and then, uh, and then inverting uh, the stimulation um, to target the brain. Um, and this is an idea that actually is, is, in some extent, has been around for a long time. Uh, there's something called reciprocity, which is the notion that if you record the electrical potential on the surface of the head, there should be some way to then invert it in order to drive the current back to the same brain regions that generated it. So there's a task, certain nodes in the brain are activated, that is then reflected in the, in the scalp EEG, and then we invert that EEG to bring current back to the same nodes that's generated it. And this is something that we've also um, addressed, uh, and that's the reference here. And I think what is, what is maybe remarkable, but it's, 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 it's physics, is that you can do this process without actually localizing the sources. Meaning, we can record the EEG, and then we can deliver stimulation in a way that optimally stimulates where we think the um, uh, brain regions are that generated the EEG, but we do that without actually localizing the target, without actually knowing where the target was. And this, this is a direct consequence of this theory of, of reciprocity.
Um, another area which I think is, is, is emerging and where we're going to see a lot of um, uh, uh, promise is in home-based therapy. And I want to, some of you may have heard about this like do-it-yourself TDCS stuff. You can go to Amazon and get it. I would, I would, this is different from that. What I'm talking about here is TDCS applied um, to patients at home under strict supervision. Uh, uh, of a researcher or a, a clinician, um, and this has been done, this has been validated, and it has many advantages. First of all, it's better for, for patients, for subjects. Um, again, when you're talking about treatment, five times a day over many weeks, you're already sick. It's quite a burden to come into the, um, the hospital. And with TDCS, in contrast to other uh, neuromodulation interventions, we can go home. And so I think the promise has always been there, and now the trials are starting to push home. And it's also very, uh, has a big advantage to the um, operators as well. It's not, you know, just the scheduling uh, as well of having so many subjects. And when you go home, there's this amazing opportunity to scale up. You can have as many subjects as you have devices, uh, and it's very, uh, it's much less painful to extend the treatment over, over a, wide period, part, a wide period of time. Uh, I'm very interested in the combination of this home-based TDCS now with you know, sort of what they're calling digital therapeutics. So these are different kinds of apps, different kinds of web-based um, cognitive therapy or, or rehab therapy that can be applied. And so we're seeing that as well where people are now uh, getting that task specificity by having the subjects do something at home, engage in a particular task, and then they're applying TDCS at the same time to make that task, that app, uh, more effective by engaging a specific network. And a final area I think that's very interesting from a technological and also um, clinical perspective is now the integration of sensors. So they're already wearing this, this cap on their head. Um, why don't we use the same cap to measure EEG? Why don't we use the same cap to measure heart rate, stress, galvanic skin response, and so on. So these technologies are also being built in, and that can be used both as a, as a biomarker, detecting obviously responses before they're necessarily clinically manifest, and ultimately as, as, as a feedback as well. Um, so I, I will wrap up there in the context of sort of digital therapeutics and neuromodulation. I wanna mention that literally just down the street from here at the Sheraton, at the end of the summer, um, I'm co-chairing a conference focusing uh, on these topics. Uh, they'll be impacted in a lot of detail. And so I would, I would certainly invite you to uh, visit the website to learn more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, that was outstanding. We have time for a few questions. If you'd like to come to the microphone. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I just want to say thank you very, very much. That was a very clear um, talk. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I just really have one point of clarification. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, am I correct in thinking that from now on, with TDCS for trials, for example, we should be considering doing, T or actually doing TDCS while subjects are actually doing a task, rather than administering at rest, for example, which is how clinical trials have typically, um, typically been performed. And I'm just wondering, because of that, and because of the bad press that TDCS has had, do you think that's something to do with the fact that TDCS during rest really isn't cutting it? And therefore, it's TDCS plus excitability, as you say, that is required. So during a task or with T yeah. um, TBS, for example. Right. So that's, that's a great question. Um, so the question is, you know, in, in reality, uh, many TDCS clinical trials, particularly if we're looking at depression or pain, uh, have not been combined with an explicit task, some kind of training. Uh, so did everything I just tell you is wrong? Um, or is there, is there a mismatch between what we're seeing at the preclinical level and what's being done? Um, I think that's a, it's, a, it's an open question. I, I think one thing we can say for sure is there's never nothing, right? So there's always placebo. There's always the clinical experience. There's always you have your lab coat and the patient's coming in and there's huge expectations. And we know that placebo is a real physiological change in the brain. So even in those situations where there's nothing, there is something, right? But then the question is, that clinical experience may be very important to, tr to, to trial outcomes. So if, if, if one center has a great clinical experience with a lot of positive vibes and patient interactions, and another one doesn't, I do believe that possibly that w could explain a, a divergence in results. And so I think at a minimum, at a minimum, if we don't combine it with a task, we should at least control that experience. What kind of room are they in? How are they greeted? So I think it's very safe right now to say we should be controlling that experience but potentially also combining with a task, and I don't think this is a big burden. I mean, they're sitting there anyways, they got the TDCS on, have them do something, and in fact, you can score that something as they do it. Um, um, and so I, I don't wanna suggest that you, to make TDCS effective, you have to really combine it with an explicit task, uh, 
um, but I, I, um, there may be a very low cost to, to including it moving forward. Great. So, Marv, thanks for thanks for a great talk. I guess um, so. I guess a, a broad a broader question for you. So, with the we with with Speak loud. close to the microphone. So, how are we going to individually calibrate these TDCS signals? Right. For TMS, we have a you know motor twitch. For TACS, maybe we have phosphines. You know seizure threshold. With all of the inherent limitations of those calibration techniques, but how are we going to do that with TDCS? Right. How do we individualize it? And I, another really great question because, and this is something that gives me a lot of pause, if you look across all neuromodulation technologies that have been very successful in crossing into relatively common clinical practice, ECT, seizure thresholds, TMS, you wouldn't conceive of doing it without motor thresholds, DBS is always titrated in, in real time. And so all successful neuromodulation technologies have used some form of acute individual titration and many neuromo neuromodulations that have failed to translate, let's talk about you know, DBS for pain, DBS for depression, lacked that acute form of, of acute translation. And so now we have TDCS where there's not necessarily an overt response. And so it does give me pause to say, wait, we're not, and, 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 and we know that there's going to be a difference both because of an, an anatomy and individual physiology and how they respond. So what about that? So one, based on that, that's going back to my point where I'd say what we're seeing right now with human trials on TDCS, for me, that's signal. I'm really happy we're seeing a signal. And I don't believe, therefore, that that is optimized because we're giving everyone the same thing. And therefore, I think there, there, we, it's, as long as we can have the resources, there doesn't seem much to lose by customizing it. Um, and it's a resource issue. So TDCS, for example, is very economical. It's very easy. We could get an MRI from each subject. We could get an fMRI from each subject. We could process that to individualize a targeted therapy for each one, but there's a cost associated for that. And are we willing to swallow it, both in the course of a trial and then finally for adopting a treatment? And so what I think would be very powerful, and I don't know what it is, is to have something where we could individualize it, but we want to make sure that it's very easy, right? So maybe it's an EEG system that's built into the TDCS device. So it's, 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 it's already caked in. Something like that needs to be there, I think, to, 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 to support adoption, even if mechanistically, it seems like clearly the way to go. Great, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, that was outstanding.